Hi all, yet another amazing game choice by David Grosvenor. In this game, uh, Leela ID 11131 is playing against Ethereal 10.88, Fast and Furious 40 moves per 2 minutes with a 2 second per move increment. So the book moves given E4, C5. We go into potentially the Sveshnikov variation. I used to love playing this with black when I was a junior. Uh, so knight db5 is the main move. This was the end of the book, and Leela chooses the theoretical knight db5. d6, bishop g5, again, very theoretically trodden. Knight a3. It's here that it's ethereal, which deviates from the most common b5 move. So that's to threaten b4. This is a Sveshnikov position I've enjoyed playing with black. For example, here, white has two main choices, either taking on f6, which is the Karpov kind of variation, more positional, but uh, and giving black minimal counterplay. Or there's this variation, which uh, you might think is the Karpov variation because it's structural damage, but actually it's more tactical uh, and more complicated to play with white, actually. So this has been seen a lot before, this kind of thing. So white has, in both cases, white should, in theory, have a small edge. Uh, but yeah, it's a very, very exciting opening with b5. So ethereal, bit of a fun spoiler, not going into the main Sveshnikov test. Maybe David can push them a bit further into that direction with b5. So here, uh, this, this has been seen before as an alternative. The downside is used fully, that it stops. b5 wasn't just pressing b4, it stops this maneuver now, knight c4. So that's probably why uh, b5 is also very popular. Uh, to stop this positional maneuver because sometimes the knight bounces towards the d5 square. So uh, black castled and now bishop takes f6. So Leela's you know, playing a bit like Karpov taking on f6 uh, to, to try and get control of that d5 square. Uh, g takes doesn't do black any favours. Queen h5 for example, this is quite justified, this kind of way of playing where white can get a grip on the f5 square and this is just a very unpleasant for black, this position. You can see that dead bishop. White well, might even strategically exchange off light square bishops. It's just a strategically winning position, uh, I believe. So this this way is necessary to give up the pawn. Necessary evil. The, the uh, lesser of the two evils, as they say. So uh, giving up the pawn, but black has that bishop pair. And white seems to be underdeveloped. Leela plays knight d5. So she's a pawn up. Can she cling on to this extra pawn or do something with it? Bishop takes, e takes, knight e7. We have the very good rook d1. So white's keeping, Leela's keeping her extra pawn up here at the moment. It was also possible to take on d8 and then play knight b6, hitting the rook. So this position was also possible, it seems. So rook d1. Rook c8. Now queen takes, queen takes, and now d6. Uh, here, if knight e3, black should have sufficient pressure with bishop g5 to at least get uh, uh, a position with dynamic equality. This way of playing it is, is looking as though it should be totally equal, for example. This is a variation. A long variation going into the end game here, but it should be an even position basically. Uh, so yeah, knight e3 doesn't probably do Leela too much favors. So we have d6, knight f5, and now c3 is played. And b5, yes, kicking the knight here to try and win d6. So that knight's involved in trying to regain the pawn, and it's actually kicks in response now. Maybe Ethereal is not assessing. If Ethereal wanted a draw with black, a human would assess is it opposite colour bishops, and maybe consider with black if wanting a draw to take here, because we end up with opposite colour bishop scenario, uh, which although white's technically a pawn up, this this kind of scenario. Let me just show you a fictional continuation deep into the end game. Uh, this is just a fictional continuation. But you see that white's extra pawn, the opposite color bishops will literally provide fantastic blockade potential. If ever white plays c4, for example, there's brilliant blockade potential. 
and it should just be a fortress draw even if engines think it's a small edge for white it's impossible to prove here I think it's just a theoretical okay so in practice blockade here fortress but this wasn't played knight h4 uh, knight a5 so look at this kind of symmetry over here with these knights e4 which does provide a peg on f3 for the knight to go to f3 with check and supported now we have a really really cool move which i didn't really appreciate until about the third pass through this game the full impact now nimsovic said the value of a file is often to be able to infiltrate and exert lateral pressure now let's extend that idea what is lateral pressure in this position if we apply that principle concretely what does the lateral pressure do for say the d5 well, d5 is the only invasion square with lateral pressure well to me uh, let's have a look what does it do one thing is that this knight is kind of less loose than it was before in some situations where this pawn is removed you can see it's a protected piece and that can be very valuable uh, for tactical variations not to lose pieces the other thing with lateral pressure it does is if the knight bounces via f3 it hasn't so easily got knight g5 and e5 so this rook really has an influence on both knights in this position a really fantastic move in many respects and sets up the scenery uh, for one of the main strategic thrusts of this game which is connected past pawns potential it really sets the whole thing up very well uh, I'll give you an example why other moves maybe not so cool Bishop eats it also stops by the way Bishop e5 <laughs> immediately that's an immediate thing which maybe black was interested in as well so Bishop eats e2 Bishop e5 uh, here this position uh, although white does have that tactic this scenario white has a small edge uh, but let's let's look at another scenario now with a4 immediately without the idea of rook d5 you can see that white is less stable here yeah, because now if you if taking greedy but it provokes white to have lots of loose pieces enough to rook a8 and if we follow this through of knight c6 hitting this rook this position uh, is good for black black's got two minor pieces for rook and it's good for black so you can see that's really uh, this cool move rook d5 has a lot of power to it stopping bishop e5 if they did but helping this knight discouraging this knight kind of making it trapped in some variations a really powerful powerful lateral pressure move uh, before the pawn break so Leela's like the master of pawn breaks. She's really preparing this pawn break. I can't emphasize enough. I found this move super cute. I hope you do too, <laughs> a little bit. So rook d7 is played. If h6 here, just as an example, a4, and we can see that knight's protected. This position is very different with the knight protected. So bishop b7, and then say this, and rook a1, and white is really getting this pawn with these two connected pass pawns as well as this pawn it's a massive advantage emerging for white positionally this cannot be allowed this kind of thing is a4 is formatic in the Sveshnikov quite often anyway so anyway rook d7 is played here a4 and the idea of this nifty rook d7 is again to challenge this bishop and you might think well doesn't that refute the whole protecting the knight concept if it's not taken black sidestepped like predator in the film predator the trap uh, of the knight being protected the knight's not protected here what do we do panic no don't panic there's a substitute although the knight's not protected there's a fantastic concept now what does white play in this position uh, just before we get into that before I ask you about that <laughs> B, B takes look let's have a look at this here there's Bishop B7 and then castles this position should be uh, favorable for white because E4 is dropping off is it should be okay even though it's opposite color bishops here it's slightly more favorable than the other other endgame example um, 
so that looks a little bit nicer for white so anyway so bishop d8 what does white play here return to this question five seconds to pause the video what would you play in this position if i give you five seconds now you might want to pause the video and analyze okay a takes yeah actually the rook still does something very useful after takes B takes it hits the a5 bishop time is critical here now we've got connected pass pawns versus an extra piece the knight plays to f3 uh yeah the bishop's hanging here you know but we can insert a check black can insert a check before moving the bishop and blockading so it looks as though isn't this bishop just going to blockade these pass pawns Bishop g2 and you can see look the Knight's not got e5 or g5 if it goes to h4 it's a bit pointless here because the Bishop takes this is pointless the unpinning King d3 is sufficient white's got a big advantage there so we have Rook c6 Rook a1 and now okay you might think instead of Rook a1 if taking as an example this position uh, should be a small edge for white anyway okay but rook a1 might actually be better here and we see now bishop a7 being played uh, there's a big uh, threat here of a7 to unblockade this d pawn by the way or if black takes then a7 after so for example h6 a7 bang bang d7 and then that is really good for white this scenario is really good for white so bishop a7 firmly blockading the a pawn white takes this pawn and we're transitioning rather rapidly now after rook c takes d6 black wants to get rid of that pawn immediately again if black wanted the draw though it's interesting to keep the extra rook around believe it or not say say this scenario i'm not entirely sure how white would make uh, progress for example this is a fictional scenario uh, pushing you know delaying uh, an exchange of rocks it seems technically this this kind of thing is an even position so anyway we we smoothly transition <laughs> to an even more simplified end game scenario so it's like a spaghetti western just out in the desert now it's just the pawns versus the bishop that's that's it it's the pawns versus the bishop here King f8, rook a5, clarity. Everything else is just blurred out now. Clarity. We have now rook h6, even more clarity. A bit too much <laughs> after rook h6. So ethereal just cracks up on this time limit. I I, I believe ethereal on on a longer time limit, multiple calls wouldn't wouldn't crack up here and would be evaluating about a million table base positions to make sure of a draw. In fact. Uh, so here though this this cracks up rook h6 it allows Alila to go into connected pass pawn mode basically <laughs> sacrificing everything else just focusing on connected pass pawns uh, the way to keep equality uh, was king f8 for example um, sorry here uh not not king f8 the king's already on f8 check and then king e7 and this position it it looks as though black has a firm enough blockade any takes there's always a7 by the way so black should have a firm enough blockade with an even position uh but no black gets greedy super greedy and we know what happens sometimes when engines get too greedy they get punished b4 just offering h2 leader is saying take my pawns see if i care all i'm interested in is the free connected pass pawn potential so one pawn is taken king d5 another pawn is taken and just too much damage it's irreversible damage has been done to black's position here with the king on c6 now the blockade is fading away the blockade potential has just faded away here uh, rook d5 another key move 
a bit like the earlier rook d5 this is very very powerful stuff this rook d5 uh, if the king had lunged into b7 then say check this this is just check time and the kings can't can't be there because it's just perpetual check uh, so this is a very very powerful move again rook d5 uh, so here king b7 bishop f2 uh, on check here king c8 this position we finally see that one of the powers is rook d7 here of rook d5 and then b5 this position is uh is winning for white yeah these pass pawns are just winning here for white black's too slow over there <laughs> so uh we see bishop f2 b5 check rook e4 rook d2 bishop e3 and you might think this is really unfortunate going into a pin as it turns out even if black didn't go into that pin by the way so you think why, why does black go into the pin and not play bishop g1 so do you think this is enough of a blockade of these past pawns after say rook d1 bishop f2 what are we what are we doing here with white <laughs> there's a nice move in this variation which wins for white here which eventually my stockfish nine found i wonder if you can spot it if i give you five seconds to pause the video the challenge where there's a will there's a way ways and means unblockade these pawns how do you do that here white to play okay rook d4 interrupts the bishop the two the two pawns trump the rook here uh, so say bishop takes yeah the pawns are just winning absolutely winning uh, so rook d4 would be the key move if rook e3 bypassing that c4 rook a3 you might think well hold on isn't this stopping the a pawn and the rooks attacked we play this and here the pawns are still uh, moving along and for example this is a disaster for black losing the bishop the pawns are still moving along basically here uh, so there's c5 for example then check check and then a7 as an example so uh yeah bishop e3 this just goes into a more elementary style position h5 king d5 and now you might guess rook takes e3 the pass pawns just trump the rook winning pass pawns absolutely winning so yeah and here the game was adjudicated as a win for white they've crashed through now i think this beautifully aesthetic scenario was helped by ethereal not going into a safe opposite colour bishop endgame uh, in particular it could have done after g4 just made sure opposite colour bishop endgame it's very fortressy so by avoiding that that was a key moment uh, of, of at least trying to hold equality but no the conditions were set especially with the key rook d5 and later again rook d5 this rook d5 move was a move to behold for preparing the a4 pawn break which set the scenery up even after the rook d7 resourceful rook d7 for bishop d8 set the scenery up for the connected pass pawns versus the bishop and then maybe later black cracked up or definitely cracked up actually going greed into greedy mode with rook h6 taking h2 again it would have been it seems possible to hold the fortress hold the fort by not being so greedy uh, so this really just on this time limit what we do get is a vivid demonstration of the power of connected past pawns although with best play it wouldn't have happened to be fair but nevertheless an attractive and instructive game in my view and a good revision for us all uh, to check the potential in our own games of past pawns and connected past pawns hope you found that too comments questions like shares appreciated thanks very much